I'm extremely excited to introduce Robin Rowe, who is the CEO of Venture Hollywood, very talented. Um, he has been involved in more projects uh, than one can even imagine uh, undertaking, and yet he does it with such skill and grace, and uh, he's become a, a good friend of ours. And um, one interesting note about Robin's work before he starts is it is under NDA, very confidential. So the slides that he uh, will be showing today will articulate what he can articulate. Uh, so I'll leave it to you to share what is shareable. You know what you can talk about, but I, I appreciate that you at least attempting to give us some type of insight because I know how much our audience enjoys that. So with that said, I will turn the camera excitingly over to you and Janneke has joined. She's going to be asking you the questions here in a moment uh, when, when you're done and welcoming our next speaker. So I'll see you guys back uh, shortly. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for including me. This is my, my second year. Uh, I, uh, when I was a speaker last year, I couldn't tell anybody what company I worked for because I worked for one of your sponsors and it was a secret that I was their AR strategist. So it, it was a very strange session for me last year where I'm like trying to talk about, uh, what I work on without talking about it. And, uh, so I'm going to show you a bunch of things that I've worked on in the past because the past is safer. Um, but this isn't all that I do. This is just to give people a flavor of the kind of stuff I do. I'm, I'm a technology smoke jumper. I, I come into companies that are struggling with some piece of technology or something that's never been done. And, you know, if they'll let me, I get the job done. So some, sometimes they stop me because they're, they're horrified that we're actually doing it. But uh, I'll, I'll leave that for another talk. So I'm going to put my slides up now, and I'm just going to run through these very fast. I'm not going to take questions uh, right now because I'm going to run through these slides at hyper speed just so that you get the whole uh, landscape of, of the stuff that I'm involved in. And then with lots of time left over, I hope, uh, we'll, we'll go into Q&A and make it mostly interactive. So uh, here we go if I can figure out how to do this without messing it up. Where is it? There it is. Okay, is that is that good? That's great, thank you. All right, here we go. Okay, so I'm an agile technologist in Hollywood. And uh, with gratitude, here's some of my past projects. Uh, th these are things that, that are in the past, so I can kind of talk about them. Uh, so uh, you'll see here that I've run the gamut. I've, I've worked in defense, I've worked in Hollywood, I've worked in embedded systems, safety critical, AR, VR, drones, uh, traffic control, television control systems. Uh, I've, I've done all kinds of cool stuff. And this one uh, is, is pretty recent. Uh, this is Mattel Barbie, the, the series Barbie Vlogger, which is one of the top uh, animated series on, uh, uh, on Google, on, uh, on YouTube. And this is all done with live actors. This, there, there are no animators on this show. This is done by computer. And here's the same thing uh, in a virtual reality game trailer. This is uh, from a popular game. And you can see in the inset what it actually looks like. That's the motion capture stage. And in real time, the software that I developed will output uh, so that the, the, the actors can be in the game and produce a game trailer in real time. And then at uh, a major studio, I worked on their supercomputing render farm and on their color. That was tremendous fun. The, the way that this came about is I had a column at the magazine Linux Journal, which sadly isn't around anymore. And I wrote uh, a story about the CTO of this company. And he said, Robin, what, what do you do when you're not writing? And I said, well, I'm a research scientist. I, I've done all this exciting stuff in the, in the film industry. And he said, well, we hire the best in the world. Anytime you want to come work here, just let me know. I said, okay, Ed, I'm letting you know, but <laughs> when do I start? So that was how I ended up uh, moving to Hollywood, actually. So I've also worked in the gaming side. This is uh, a couple of 
uh, poker bots playing against each other. I've actually got 10,000 poker bots playing each other at, at many, many tables. I can't look at all of them at the same time. This is just one table with two poker bots playing each other. And these poker bots are also chat bots, so they'll compliment each other on how well they're playing or, or uh, insult each other based on what a bad job they're doing. Then here's a project from last year. This is Enterprise AR. And on the right, you can kind of see uh, the way that this is used, that th this is for uh, an engineering staff where a, a virtual uh, assistant is, is guiding them through, and, and not so virtual in this case, there's an actual operator on the other side that's letting them look, that, that's seeing what they see in this jet engine and, and walking them through what, what to do. Whoops, am I stuck? I'm stuck. Interesting. Oh, there we go. Uh, so I have this slide uh, about the evolution of VR and AR because it's it's everyone says that we just invented this stuff, but actually it came out in 1861. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was the first star of VR. Uh, so we've been working on this for a while. It keeps getting better, uh, but we still have a ways to go. Uh, I come from a research background. Uh, I taught at the Naval, at the Naval Postgraduate School and at the University of Washington. I taught C++ and SLAM Robotics and, and worked in VR. So this is what SLAM Robotics is. These are, these are robots that understand, they're, they're, that have situa they have situational awareness, if I speak a little more slowly. Uh, so on the left here, we have the DARPA robots from the DARPA Robotics Challenge. This is, this is an autonomous robot walking around. This, this robot is a firefighter. And so this is an autonomous vehicle, except not the usual kind. This, is a regular vehicle being driven by an autonomous robot. So, so this is an autonomous chauffeur here. And then on the right, this is from the Naval Postgraduate School. This is a mapping torpedo that goes around in Monterey Bay and maps the bay autonomously. It has no communication when it's underwater. It has to surface in order to communicate. So it has to be completely autonomous as it operates underwater. All right, and then uh, this is a uh, global command and control system I worked on. Uh, this uh, monitors all television channels in real time and says if, if something is popping on TV that maybe you want to flick on CNN because this might be of concern to you. And I had the pleasure of getting to sail in an aircraft carrier to test this at sea. Uh, another, another Navy project was uh, hunting for virtual submarines. It's very expensive to deploy a submarine for sailors to, to for sonar operators to train on. So uh, we put a virtual submarine into the destroyer uh, so they'd have a submarine to chase even when there's no submarine there. And then with sports cameras, that was Internet, uh, Internet of Things that's a used a format called MQTT, which uh, is sort of like HTTP but handles disconnected devices and is very, very interesting, a lot of fun. Uh, then in satellite set tops, I worked on uh, security and channel expansion. Uh, traffic control, uh, if you've walked across the street, my life may have been in your hands because I wrote some of the traffic control software that controls uh, the traffic lights in this country. And then with drones, uh, we used a military drone to do precision farming and infrastructure uh, inspection, um, you know, to look at bridges, uh, look at railways. Um, and then I founded the speech uh, AI lab at a defense company. And this is just one of the funny situations that came about uh, where the admiral uh, asked an ad hoc question to the, to the speech recognition. This is uh, like Siri, except we're back in the 90s. We, we had Siri a long time ago before it came, became cheap enough to be a consumer item. So in the military, you could ask you know, the equivalent of Siri a question here. And the, the admiral's asking, you know, where are my aircraft carriers? Because that's a very logical question if you're an admiral. And, so, and our SR is coming back and saying, well, sorry, you don't have any. And the air admiral is like, well, you know, this is just a test, right? And we're like, no, we've got the real data. And so the admiral's upset. And what actually happened is that he had managed to ask just in, the, in a brief moment of window where all the carriers were being redeployed and no carrier was on station. And that wasn't supposed to happen. So it, it didn't happen again after that. So one of my, my first project was building the robotic television studios for a major network. Uh, this studio can run for 48 hours completely autonomously with no operators 
except for the news anchors sitting in their seats in the studio. Okay, so why does C++ matter? I've taught this at a couple of universities. Everything runs on C++. So I know all about C++. If you have a highly technical question, I can answer that. Uh, I also care about Agile. Uh, then uh, C++ for safety critical is important. This is the famous uh, Robert Overcracker incident where uh, he uh, did a jet ski over Niagara Falls with a parachute where he jumps off and deploys the parachute, except he had an unknown unknown in this case. He forgot to test the parachute when it's wet. So that, that did not turn out well. So in C++, we try to do encapsulation. Uh, this is the same principle that ships work on, that we have watertight compartments. But just like ships, it isn't foolproof. You, we can still sink the thing if we, if we make a mistake. This is nine nines. This comes out of uh, a friend at Google, his presentation, and what it takes to get to nine nines. Nine nine reliability is, is one tenth the time of the blink of an eye. So when we do safety critical and, and high reliability systems, uh, it becomes a very interesting uh, realm that we live in. Here are the innovation laws. Uh, Sarnoff's law, this is, this is us. Our, our broadcast network is, is worth what we're worth. Uh, Moore's law, that technology doubles every 18 months. Parkinson's law, that work expands to fill the time. The Peter principle, that incompetence expands to fill the work. Brooks law, that adding manpower when late will make fresh delays because we have to train them. And Murphy's law, that what can go wrong will go wrong, uh, whatever is the most inconvenient time. And Chekhov's gun, uh, this is that non-essential things in our design will, will credit up and cause us to have bugs and cause things to fail and those have to be removed. And then for a management principle, the Pareto principle, we really need to be attentive to this. This is that 20% of our effort gets 80% of the result. And we can apply that to the 20% and then we get, you know, 20% of 20% is 4%. So 4% of our effort actually results in more than half of the result that we get. So we need to be very focused and, and decide what we're doing. So this is from Wikipedia. This is Technical Committee 279. I lead work group 56007, uh, which is the innovation management, uh, idea management uh, section. Here's the kind of stuff that we're working on. This is brand new from yesterday. We're still writing the standard. It comes out next year. Uh, so how do we see ourselves? This is my own company. And this is a Hero 6 diagram where our head is the product, our arms are brand and processed, and our feet, our team and customers, and our belly is our decisions. So here's a bunch of our pre-launch startups. Uh, these aren't particularly secret because we own them, but nobody cares because they're not famous yet. We're in a hit-based business where being a hit is everything. Here's a revenue projection, projection slide. I've, I've never seen anybody else release one of these, so I'm just putting it here. Uh, so that people that are wondering what the backside of, of private equity looks like, uh, we're saying, okay, there are 2.3 billion active email accounts. And when you don't know the number, the number is 2%. That, that's from direct marketing. Any, any direct marketing campaign that's not focused, that you're not sure what you're going to have happen, your target is 2% of the population. So if we actually could get 2% to join our free SaaS service, that's 46 million users, but they're all free. But we think maybe we can sell five cents of advertising on each user per month, and that would give us three million in monthly recurring revenue. Now, 2% of the 2%, we think we can convert to paid users. So that would give us 1 million people that are actually paying, and we're gonna charge them $7 a month. That's $7 million in MMR. In MRR. Uh, together, that's $10 million in MRR uh, times uh, 12 times eight, and we get $960 million as our, as our valuation. So that's just how the math works. Uh, the main thing to know about VCs is that they invest in monetization, not innovation. Uh, they're half of the money that VCs give to companies are the companies turn around and spend it on Google and Facebook ads. So most of the investment is actually going to Google and Facebook, not to your company if you're a startup founder. Okay, and coming to the end here, uh, I ran for office in the recent election in March, and it, it was very interesting. I learned a lot about our political system, and I can talk about how we need to run better politics if people have time for such a thing to discuss.
And that's the end. There's my email if anybody wants to email me or LinkedIn works just as well. And with that, I will stop sharing and we will let everyone start talking. Do we have any questions? Uh, is Mallory or Yanakon? Do we have? Sorry, I, I was speaking with a muted camera. I did the newbie mistake <laughs> here. I'm back on. Uh, well, lovely presentation. Can you please? Um, that that's a lot of differences, different topics, and how can one human cover all of that? Can you please explain to me what common ground they all have? Because I I know they all have common ground, but I want to hear it from you. Okay, so uh, sorry to give you my life story, but as a child, I wanted to be a research scientist. And I grew up on a farm and not a lot of research scientists in my vicinity. And uh, I had won a math contest as a grade schooler. And because of that, I thought tests were cool. And so uh, I skipped a couple of grades, got into high school. And I said, can I take the college entrance exam? Even though I'm too young to go to college, I think tests are really cool. I think that'd be fun. And so I did that. And I got a letter from the Air Force saying that they would like me to be an officer because I had one of the highest scores in the country. I was like, well, I'm a little young. I'm 12. Uh, so um, you know, I ended up on this trajectory. And MIT wrote me and said that they would, that they would have me. And that, that was all great. Uh, but I ended up on this research trajectory that I really didn't know what I was doing. I had no one to advise me that, you know, no, no professors in my family. And so I, I've had to stumble through. And so the reason that it looks like such a hodgepodge is it is such a hodgepodge. My, my life is all serendipity. And I work in a hit-based business where people call me and they need me immediately. And often they want me to do something I've never done before. And, and this just makes the heads of recruiters explode because recruiters call me every day and say, hey, Robin, you've worked at all these great companies. You should do, you know, and, you know, what, what are you? And, and I said, well, I'm a unicorn. And they're like, well, what's a unicorn? And I'm like, well, you know, I work, I build stuff that's never been built before. And, and, and they're just not geared to, to have that answer. You know, they want to, they want to find my lane. You know, I had, I had a very interesting uh, uh, so discussion on that, on that topic, Robin. What's on that, that topic, um, Guy ahead. Kawasaki mentioned that, for instance, during Apple, like if you ask people what they wanted, they'd say they wanted an Apple too. They couldn't predict that they could have an iPhone. And I really feel that that's where you fit and you can see the future somehow by putting all these different pieces together from different industries. Mm -hmm. I, I hope so, but usually I'm called in because it's a fire. You know, I, I've got you know, we have our own investment, we have our own capital group that owns a bunch of companies. And until one's a hit, nobody cares. You know, it's, it's not so much that we're secret and stealthy, it's that you can't get arrested in Hollywood until you're already famous. So, uh, you know, there's that side of our business, which I do when I'm not smoke jumping. But oftentimes a company will call me and they'll say, you know, we're building new AR glasses and you founded the research, the, the, the speech recognition lab at a defense company. We think that you could help us with speech recognition. Would you come and, and work on our speech recognition you know, piece of this project? And I say, yeah, that would, that would be fabulous. And so, you know, I go and do that. And when I get there, they'll say, hey, you know, could you also work on this other thing that's completely unrelated? And I always say yes to that too. So I just keep saying yes, and it, it creates, uh, a difficulty in focus. I, I will agree with that. Well, uh, in the end, it's all C++, right? In the end, it's all C++ because people, you know, just as English is, you know, really underpins our society. It would be very difficult to run America tomorrow if we suddenly said, English, we're done. No, no more English. You have to use something else. You know, if you, you know, I live in Los Angeles, you know, a number of people here speak Spanish, so we, we might get by, but it would be really rough. And what people don't realize is that C++ is the English of software. Just about everything we have in this country and in, across the world is somehow based on C++. Uh, could you please elaborate a little bit on Agile? You had to slide up for a fraction of a second. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the... Um, okay. So there are a number of innovation... I, I call them ideologies. Some people have a big problem with that word. 
the, the reason that I call them an ideology is that the people that practice them tend to tend to look at them as being their religion. Um, that they aren't necessarily true, but they're certainly true to the people that are doing them. Um, in, in the beginning, there was chaos where, where people just did whatever and, and whatever happened, happened. And sometimes it was good, but mostly it was chaos. And then the defense industry said, well, we can't, we can't work this way uh, because we can't price anything. We can't, we can't say what anything will cost and the government doesn't like that. So in order to, to do government contracting, we need to decide what we're building, write it down, then build it and charge the government to build what we said we would build and hopefully not have a cost overrun, but they often did it anyway. And so the government said, well, you promised us that waterfall would be no more cost overruns, but we have cost overruns all the time. And so there's this thing in open source where it was agile, where people would start writing the code and then do the design. And, you know, that seems very, um, you know, very radical to people that come from waterfall. How, how can you write the code first? You have to have the design first. But that's what agile is all about, because if we create some design, if we, if we create some code first, if we implement some things, we can quickly find out that that doesn't work, that you know, the thing that we thought that we wanted to do, we no longer want to do it after we try it a little bit. And, and that's what Agile is all about. It's, it's a huge practice. I can't explain it in, in smaller soundbite than that. I find it interesting you're combining both entertainment and uh, military. Uh, that's two fields I also find myself in. And they actually have a lot of similarities. Have you found similarities? Like for instance, we build something behind the scenes as programmers, but it hasn't actually been tested in the field. And when it has to be tested, it has to work immediately. Okay, so the thing about the military is that the government funds almost all of innovation funding. VCs don't actually fund innovation, they fund monetization. When, it, when a VC is looking at a company, they're like, well, show us your, your MVP, show, you know, preferably you've already got recurring revenue. Well, that's not innovation, you know, that's already built. You know, if you want to build something from scratch, if you want to build something that's actually new, you either have to have friends and family money, uh, in which case you're building something probably pretty small, or you have to get a government grant if you need to do something bigger. And so most of the government grants are either in the military or in uh, medicine. So if you're building some, if you want to build something that is for the military or want to build something for a hospital, you get a government grant. Otherwise, it, it is what it is. It's very tough. Uh, we're going to take questions from the audience. Alexander Ross has written in, uh, you don't take pitches. What? You don't take pitches. How do you find new projects? Okay, well, I, live, I do everything by serendipity. So they, they actually find me. But, but we're not VCs, we're private equity. So I, I know it's confusing because we have venture in our name, but you know, we didn't think, and we also have Hollywood in our name, and that was initially geographic. And so everyone thinks that we're movie producers, which there's a little truth to that, but not really. And so our name is just confusing. Sorry about that. But anyway, um, here's how venture capital works. If you're a venture capitalist, you go out and you find LPs to give you $20 million or $200 million, whatever your, whatever your, whatever your raise is. And you go out and raise a, a boatload of money from your rich friends by telling them how smart you are from the last deal that you ran. Then you take half of that money and you put it in reserve. And then you go out and you find 20 companies that you think are winners to invest in. But the reality is that we, we know from science that VCs are terrible at picking winners. They're, they're no good at all. Uh, YC did a study and found out that picking the companies at random was just as good as vetting them, that it made absolutely no difference. It's just a wasted effort. But it makes VCs feel important that they're doing this and it's their money, so we continue to do it this way. So why does this work? How is it that VCs can make all this money when they're no good at picking winners? The, the answer is that they pick 20 of them. And of that 20, there's a better than 50-50 chance that one of them will be a winner. And so they pick 20, uh, they fund them, and then uh, after a while, they decide these are the four companies that, that have got traction, that, that seem to have legs, and the rest of them are losers. And then they take the second half of their money that they reserved, and they put that on the winners to try to see if they can make them into a unicorn, if they can get them across the line and have that one company that, that makes their fund 
outperform. That's, that's the VC world. In the PE world, uh, people are buying companies. They say, I want the whole thing. If, this, if I know what I'm doing, if, if I can actually pick winners, I don't want uh, you know, 5% of 20 winners. I want 100% of one winner. And so the people that are good at picking winners do private equity and they own the whole thing. And if you own the whole thing, you can either go buy the whole thing or you can build it from scratch. You know, that's another conversation. Next question. Um, I am about to start up a space startup crowdfunding platform. Wondering who should I approach for investment? Fintechs investors or space investors? Uh, well, the reality is that we all raise money wherever we can. Um, you know, the thing with raising money, you know, I, I had um, someone uh, text me this week and said that he had some money for me if I wanted to invest it. And, and I, I actually passed on it um, because I didn't feel that I had the focus to, to do something with that money for what he wanted to do with it. And, and, he, and also the returns that he had in mind weren't big enough for me. Um, one of the things that people don't get about investing when they're just starting out is that you have is that you really do have to have money to make money. If you're going to double your money, then you have to say, okay, well, you know, maybe you need 100k a year to, you know, to to have a decent living where you are. At least, or maybe that's what you'd make in a day job. Or maybe it's 200k. I don't know. Or maybe it's only 50. But whatever that number is, if you decided I'm going to quit my day job and live by investment, you would need that much money in order that if it, in a year you could double it that you would make as much as you would have made having a day job. And so there's a great shortage of capital. It, it's, it's really frustrating because, you know, there's so much dry powder. There, there's so much money on account. The, the reason that we can keep printing money like crazy and we don't have crazy inflation is that it's all sitting in the bank. No one's willing to spend it. As long as it's just sitting there unspent, it doesn't cause inflation. And so, you know, we have all these stimulus and, and other things that we're doing that, are propping up big businesses, but you know when Apple is sitting on two billion dollars in cash, or or maybe it's more than that now. I don't even keep track of it. Well, it's just sitting there. You know, it's not it's not going anywhere. So um, convincing people to give us the uh, money. Is, Robin, is I'm going to have to cut you off pretty quickly right. and make room for the next speaker. Oh, no. um, pretty quickly, can we just talk? Uh, what do you see for the future? I'll give you ten seconds. Uh, well, I got into politics this year because I'm very concerned about our political system. You know, everyone thinks that voting for the president is going to do the job. And the issue is that the president is just the pinnacle of a system that works exactly like that all the way down to your local city council. So we need good people to run for their local city council and fix the system from the bottom up. Because even if we would elect a president that, you know, whatever your political leaning is would correct everything. The, the massive uh, weight of the apparatus beneath him means that, that he can't change it. We've got to change it at our local city council first. Thank so you so much, Robin. To We're going to have to move on to Amy. I wish we could keep you here for an hour. This has been very insightful. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.